I'm Nicole, this is Lauren. Um, I believe we stopped here at this part of birth control. So yeah, right? Okay, cool, thank you. Um, so we'll go through this. Uh, we'll probably get to some other values and stuff like that today. So, um, so first we'll talk about this chart goes by like most effective um, down to what's considered least effective. And we'll talk about that a little bit more. Um, so abstinence is the one that is 100% um, effective against STIs and pregnancy. Okay. So that abstinence, we'll talk a little bit more about that. Um, but that's the choice not to engage in any kind of sexual activity. The next one on this list is surgical sterilization. So that is a permanent surgery. Um, if you've heard of a vasectomy or someone getting their tubes tied, right? That's tubal ligation is the actual term for it. Um, that's about 99% effective, but it's not recommended for young people because it's a permanent procedure, right? So then there is the IUD and the implant, um, the intrauterine device. So that's in the top corner there, and then the implant is here, so it's in the arm. So the IUD is inserted into the uterus by a doctor. Um, it lasts about five to 10 years, and it just releases those types of hormones that we talked about. Um, the implant is put into the arm by a doctor, and that lasts about three to five years. So both the IUD and the implant are considered long-acting reversible contraceptives. Um, that means that once they're taken out of the body, fertility can come back. Uh, let's see. And they last for a really long time, right? So they're, um, they're becoming more common with you know younger people, people in their 20s, um, because they, add that protection for so long without any required maintenance. So like you don't have to get a prescription every month or go back to the doctor or anything like that. Like once it's put in, it's put in and it'll last till you're ready to have it taken out or that five to 10 years. Um, yeah, and they're about 99% effective. The next one on here is the contraceptive injection. So that's the depo per vera shot. Um, that's given in the doctor's office every three months. So once every three months. That's about 94% effective. Then there's the oral contraceptive, so the pill. The thing with the pill is it needs to be taken at the same time every day um, for it to be the most effective because you need to keep that level of hormones like stable throughout your body throughout the day. Most people don't do that or they forget to take it or they skip a day, right? Because it can be hard to remember. Um, so the typical effectiveness rate is about 91%. There's also some kind of, um, sometimes different medications that you may take, like antibiotics that can interfere with the effectiveness of the pill. So it's just important to know that stuff. Um, make sure you know you let your doctor know everything you're taking. Then there is the vaginal ring. So every month a new ring is put into the vagina um, and left in place for three weeks. On the fourth week, you take it out. Um, that will be the week that likely you're menstruating. There's also a patch. So that's like a band-aid or a sticker um, that goes on your skin and the hormones are absorbed through the skin. You apply one patch once a week for three weeks and on the fourth week you don't use anything just like the, the ring. Um, those are, that's, the ring and the patch are both about 91% effective as well. So all of those that I just mentioned other than abstinence are all um, pregnancy prevention only, right? Because they're hormonal methods. They do not protect against STIs. Um, but it is important to know that somebody may be taking one of these methods of um, birth control, these hormonal methods, and not actually be sexually active, okay? Doctors can prescribe them for a wide range of symptoms, things like acne, cramping, um, heavy menstrual periods. So just know that just because someone's taking them doesn't mean they're having sex. If you do wanna protect against STIs as well, um, that's where the condom would come in. So that's the last one on the list here. Condoms effectiveness are based off of what it's made out of. So latex is the, is the best, the most effective. Um, on this chart, it says 82%, which may be a lot lower than you expected or have been told previously. That's typical use, okay? And the problem with that is that a lot of people don't know how to use them correctly, or they've never been told how to use them correctly. Um, so you have to use a new condom every, sex, every time you have sex with every sex act. And you have to use them correctly, okay? So the first thing is they have expiration dates. 
So you need to be able to check the expiration date. They're about five years shelf life and they're perfect, perfect storage. So check the expiration date, make sure it's not expired. Um, then you have to, like, while you have it, you have to make sure you're storing it correctly. He's talking about that too. So don't store it in a wallet, okay? Because as it, the wallet rubs against it, that friction will cause the latex to degrade. And the latex is what's, what makes it effective, right? Um, don't put it in sunlight or leave it in a hot car, anything like that. Um, so yeah, make sure it's, uh, it's you know stored correctly and it's not expired. So it's definitely, you can be on a birth control method, one of these hormonal methods, and still want to use condoms. Yeah. Isn't all condoms latex? So some people have latex allergy. Um, so they do make options for those people. They're made out of like sheep skin or lamb skin. The problem with those, um, they are effective, but they're not as effective because um, the skin could be like more porous. So um, the effectiveness rate goes down a little bit. So if you don't have a latex allergy, latex is the best to use. Yeah. So what if you don't use the wallet very much? Would it still be okay to use? It's possible. They just, if, if they don't use their wallet often. Like if it's just in the wallet and sitting somewhere, like it may not be as bad, but like if you're using it and putting it in your pocket and sitting on it, you know what I mean? All that rubbing against it could cause it to degrade. So if you just have it in a wallet and the wallet's sitting on your dresser, yeah, that's, that probably won't be as, you know, as rough as if you were taking it in and out of your pocket every day and sitting on it and all that kind of stuff. Yeah, the best place I always like, just in a drawer or in the box that they come in, in a drawer, right, is the best way. Um, yeah, just somewhere where they're not going to be like bothered very often. Don't throw them in a purse either. Um, so using it correctly, right? So check the expiration date. Open the package carefully. So on TV, like people are very dramatic, right? They use their teeth, they rip it open. Just open it slowly with, so that there's no like way that you can puncture it. Um, check it out. Make sure it's not brittle or dry. You know, if it's stored in sunlight, it will become very dry. Um, um, it should feel like a balloon, right? Like a, like a rubber but latex balloon. Should be pliable. So then you wanna hold, leave a space at the end, at the tip, okay? That's where the semen is gonna collect. And then you're gonna unroll it down to the base of the erect penis. Um, and you're gonna make sure there's no air bubbles in it. Smooth it out, make sure it fits appropriately. Once ejaculation happens, um, you're gonna hold hold it, the condom at the base of the penis and slide it off. Make sure all the semen stays collected inside of it and then dispose of it properly. So throw it away, don't flush it, don't leave it on the ground or anything like that. So every sex act that you have, you have to use a new condom, right? Because um, again, that material can degrade once it's used. And also if you're going from like anal sex to vaginal sex, you don't wanna introduce anything into the vagina like Lauren had talked about on Monday. Um, to cause UTIs or anything like that. So new condom each time. All right, so that's that. Um, if you have any other questions about that, just let me know. So we're gonna talk about values a little bit. Um, and what's important about this is you have to consider what's important to you when you're making decisions about sex. So we gave you a bunch of information about the risks, right? Pregnancy and STIs. So now what do you do with that? Um, a lot of times we say, go out and make good choices, but if you don't know how to make good choices, it's really difficult to, um, or if you don't know what a good choice is, it's hard to make that. So we're gonna talk about some of those things. Um, and just know that everyone's values are different. So everything that we're gonna talk about, you may have a different opinion about it than the person sitting next to you, and that's totally fine. This is all for you to um, evaluate and see how you feel about it. So your values are the things that you care about, right? The things that are very important to you. They come from a lot of different sources. So parents, religion, um, society, your culture, all those things can make up what's important, like your values. So they usually help you determine what you feel is right versus what's wrong. Um, and obviously that comes into play when it comes to sexual activity. So this slide has a lot of questions on it. It's also available on our website. So. Um, We'll give you the website and all that. You can go and really spend some time reading through these and asking yourself them and thinking about them. And I'm gonna tell you like, no one ever like presented something like this to me when I was your age. And I, it would have been nice if they did. 
So this is a lot of stuff that nobody really thinks about ahead of time. Um, so even if you know you're not gonna engage in a, se in a sexual relationship for a while or anything like that, it's still worth looking at these questions because they help you determine your values. Um, if you're in the heat of the moment and someone's like, hey, let's have sex, you're not gonna go through or be thinking about some of these questions. You wanna already know, you know how you feel, what your opinion is about some of this stuff so that you can make good choices at that time. Um, you're not making an impulsive decision, right? Impulsive decisions we usually make with emotions and all that stuff. Um, so some, just some that I'm gonna point out, like how will I feel if we break up? So what if, you know, yeah, you're in a relationship, you probably don't think you're gonna break up with that person, but what if you do? So now's a good time to think about that. If you are in a relationship, um, you know, before you get in a relationship, if you break up with that person after you've had sex with them, how are you gonna feel about that? Um, what extra strains can come on the relationship? So how's that relationship gonna change once you've had sex with that person? Just being aware, being um, prepared for that kind of stuff, right? It will help you just have a better relationship as well with that person. When am I ready for sex? And with, like, what are my expectations, right? What do you expect it to be like? Um, what happens if all you do is have sex? If that's the only way that this relationship, you know, that's all you ever do, how are you gonna feel about that? So just thinking about some of these things, um, how are you gonna prevent pregnancy? How are you gonna prevent STIs? What methods, what things do you wanna do, right? So thinking about those things ahead of time are really important. If you're not able to like look at every single question up here and have a confident answer, then I'm gonna say that you shouldn't be engaging in sexual activity yet um, because you need to be able to communicate all of these things to your partner. And that's what's gonna have a healthy relationship. These are gonna help you, these questions will help you determine your values and your boundaries, all right? And those are the two things that you really need to hold true in a, in a relationship. So again, this is all individual and personal, right? So you, could, you are the only one that gets to make the choice about this stuff and when you're ready. So we've talked about abstinence, and we've said that it's the only way to 100% prevent sexually transmitted infections and pregnancy. Um, but abstinence isn't just this simple concept, okay? Sometimes people think abstinence means that, um, that someone has never had sex, and that's not true. What it actually means is that um, someone's choosing at this moment to not have sex. So it can be made, it's a decision that can be made at any point in someone's life. It doesn't mean that you've never had sex, and it doesn't mean that you're never going to. What it means is right now where you're at in your life, you're choosing not to, and that's a perfectly acceptable decision. So um, it can be defined differently by different people too. So you have to know like, when you say you're abstinent, are you completely sexually abstinent, or are you only like not gonna engage in um, vaginal sex or something like that, right? So being able to communicate that with your partner but not engaging in any kind of sexual behavior, so total sexual abstinence is the only way to, to be 100% effective at reducing those risks. So the other thing you have to think about is intimacy, all right? So intimacy means that um, two people are really close, right? They care about each other. Um, they can tell each other what they think and feel and that they can open up to each other. So they're gonna be able to be true to those values that we went through and know that their partner's gonna respect them. So you have to decide what, what's intimate to you, okay? Intimacy happens on a scale. Um, some people aren't, they don't like to share a lot about themselves. So someone like that may think that, you know, telling someone a secret or really opening up to someone is a lot more intimate than the actual act of sex. And then there's some people that might be the complete opposite. And that, those are both acceptable choices, um, but you need to decide that, right? What is an in, what's intimacy for you? So intimacy, what we're talking about is this feeling of deep personal closeness, okay? That support, being able to feel emotionally and physically safe with someone um, while staying true to all your boundaries and your values that we talked about. Um, so, Intimacy, when you're in a relationship, it will grow pretty gradually, um, but steadily, because you're getting to know someone. And the more you get to know someone, the more close you feel to them. So it's really, um, if you look up intimacy in the dictionary, it will, one of the definitions will say having sex.
but we are not talking about that here. We're talking about just that close relationship. Okay, so if you've heard someone say like, I'm gonna have an intimate gathering with my friends. Um, that just means they're having their closest friends and it's gonna be like, you know, a close um, gathering. So that's, that's, you can have an intimate relationship with a variety of people, all right? Not just a romantic partner. It could be with your friends, your siblings, whoever you feel like you can just open up to. So that means that couples who choose to be sexually abstinent can still have a very intimate relationship. Um, and yeah, I mean, that can be a little confusing. So sometimes when you're, when you're talking to people, um, these intimate relationships can start to lead to conversations about sex if you're in a romantic relationship with someone because of a variety of reasons. So like if you're spending a lot of time, you and that person alone, um, you care about one another, right? And that's, gradu that's gradually like growing. If you want your relationship to change a bit or to grow, um, if you're talking about the future, making commitments, um, talking about marriage, living together, talking about children, um, just in general, just having hormones, this strong desire. Also, it says up here they want to be recognized as a legitimate couple. Um, some people think that. That's something they have to do, right? The thing is, is that there's no check boxes for being a couple. There's nothing you have to check off, okay? There's no criteria. If you and your partner say you're a couple, then you're a couple. You do not have to have sex to prove that to anyone. So we're gonna talk about healthy relationships. And this part, um, I'm gonna be honest, it is so important for your age group. When I was here before coronavirus, um, I had some office hours down in the counseling center and people would come talk to me about their relationship. And it was like, your age group is very prone to having unhealthy relationships because they're new, right? Um, so this goes for any type of relationship, not just a romantic partner. So you can think about this with anybody that you have relationships with. So like siblings, um, coworkers, friends, right? Friends is a big one for this. Friendships, um, teachers, coaches, mentors, anybody in your life that you have a relationship with, you can use what we're gonna talk about now. So like I said, there's a lot of different types, right? They're universal. So even if we don't want to have a relationship with anybody, we have some kind of relationship with somebody in our life. So the thing that you have to remember is that any relationship that's healthy will have um, value. It will add something to your life. And it's okay if you, your relationships change or you have to move on from people. Um, so relationships are going to be at their complete healthiest when they exhibit clear standards and boundaries. That is the biggest like takeaway from this. So that's part of why when we're talking about a sexual relationship, um, that you need to go through those questions. And you need to know what your boundaries are and what your standards are. Because you need to be able to communicate those, you need to be strong in them to have a healthy relationship. So there's an acronym that um, we use at Girls Inc. Okay, to remember the things that you'll find in a healthy relationship. And it's HER. Honesty, equality, respect, and responsibility. So these four things will come up in every healthy relationship. So just some, we're gonna go through this quick, just some signs um, that y'all point out some things. These slides are also on our website because I know, like I said, this is so important for you. Think of someone that you have a relationship with, even if it's not a romantic partner, if it's a friend, because a lot of these come up with friendship. Um, you should be happy with that person. You should be yourself. You shouldn't have to be someone you're not. Um, you should always be able to be honest with each other, right? Um, you feel, you're feeling that intimacy growing. You're feeling closer to them as your relationship develops. They respect your thoughts and feelings. Let's say they respect your boundaries, right? So about engaging in sexual activity. How about anything, right? Like I said, even if this is about friends, your friends respect your boundaries. Um, your partner's okay with you spending time by yourself. So sometimes it's okay not to be connected to somebody all the time, right? And the reason I'm saying that this is important with friends too is because I have a daughter and I have to tell her this stuff with some of her friendships. Like, hey, disconnect, okay, it's all right. It's okay to go and do something in your room and draw or whatever it is that you wanna do. Um, because sometimes people get mad, right? If we 
they can't get in touch with us, or we're constantly texting and things like that. Um, so it's okay to have time to yourself. You are your, your, your best advocate, right? So you always need to keep what's important to you at the forefront of your, what decisions you're making. Um, so yeah, you should be able to just walk away for a little bit and still know that that person, I mean, like I have really good friendships with people in a different state that I don't talk to every day, but I know as soon as I go back to them and I tell them something, like we're gonna reconnect, like pick up, like we just, you know, have been talking every day for the rest of our lives. Like, so that's the thing that matters. Um, them being okay with you living your life too. So you're not afraid to talk about something that's bothering you. Um, some people think that healthy relationships don't have issues or that people in healthy relationships never argue or disagree. And that is really not true, okay? Because again, we are very opinionated people as humans. Um, and you may, you, something may happen, you know, that either you did something to upset your partner or your friend or something like that. What makes it, with the difference between healthy and unhealthy is how you handle that and how you deal with it. So being able to talk about it, being able to communicate about it is what's important. Um, so recognizing that there's something wrong, right? That goes back to that responsibility part of that HER acronym. Um, really being able to take responsibility for your role in that relationship and then talk out your issues. And we're gonna talk about some things, um, how to discuss these things with your friends or your partners or whoever. Um, your partner really should be recognizing these special occasions in your life or, or you know, when you're doing, trying to do good, um, so like if your your partner has um, is not in the stuff but knows about this this whole thing, they want to encourage you to get your work done. Okay, they want you to do the best that you can. They're going to encourage that. Um, I mean even for each other, to encourage each other, right? Like that that's a good thing. Um, and they encourage you to be who you are. So not only do you get to be yourself, right? and you're perfectly fine being who you are, you're, the people who you have healthy relationships with will celebrate that. They will encourage you to be the best version of yourself. All right? Um, being able to just actively root for each other's happiness, that's a very important thing. So I put this in there, um, something I found, and it's kind of, it was a, I did it quickly in the car. Um, so I'll put this on the website too so that you might be able to see it better. But I really like, we've all heard of red flags, right? You know, that's a red flag, that's a red flag. What about green flags, right? What things are good? Um, so this is what you should be looking for in a healthy relationship. If the person can apologize when they are wrong, all right? If they can say, I'm sorry, or I was wrong, I did that. That's a really good sign. The things that they're saying to you and the way that they're acting are one and the same. Right, they align with each other. Um, they're not saying one thing and doing another. If they encourage you to have friendships with other people or to engage with your family and those types of things, again, kind of going back to that being disconnected every once in a while. If they're talking about people in their past disrespectfully, how do you think they're thinking about you, okay? And yeah, maybe there is some reason that they're doing that, and that's fine. Like some people, you know, not everyone has a great relationship in their past. But if they can still understand why that was important and what, you know, those types of things, and they can talk a little bit positively, that's, um, or maybe not positively, but respectfully. If they're able to communicate, okay? Communication is what makes relationships um, really what they are. So. The reason that we have like marriage counselors and relationship therapists and stuff is because of communication. Because communication is really difficult and people struggle with it and that's what breaks down um, relationships. So if they're able to communicate uh, clearly with you, you understand what they're saying and they're being honest, that's a green flag. They set their own boundaries, um, they honor your boundaries and they respect your boundaries. This is so important. All right, and again, why we went through those, those questions is because you need to know your boundaries. You can't expect someone else to respect your boundaries and honor your boundaries if they don't know what they are. And so you need to know what your boundaries are first. If they 
show up for you, okay? We know what that means. Like they show up and they offer you the space to be authentic and they allow you to show up for them. That's that equality in the relationship. If they are intentional about resolving conflict, so again, conflict happens, but if they actually actively want to make it better, right? Make, figure out the problem and move on. If they're working to grow, you know, they want to be a, be a different person and be better. If your goals for your relationship align, and this is something that you guys should talk about when you decide that you want to be, you know, whatever word you use now, like exclusive, or you are going to be in a relationship, you should have goals that align. Like, okay, well, school is important to us, so, you know, our relationship's not going to get in the way of school or these types of things. And if you just feel appreciated, you feel seen in that relationship and appreciated, these are green flags. These may seem obvious, all right? Especially if you're like, well, yeah, I wanna be in a relationship, like, yeah, this stuff should be happening. But I'm telling you, like, it needs to be said. It's kind of like the consent thing. Um, it seems obvious when we talk about it, but then when we're in the moment, it's just not as easy for us to process. So think of some of these things. Um, when you're thinking about a relationship. So remember that relationships should make you feel happy, they should make you feel energized, they should make you feel comfortable. Um, if they're not, you're wasting your time. Why are you in a relationship? What is the point, right? Um, just look for some of these, we just looked at green flags, some of the red flags. Um, if only one person is the person deciding where to go, what to do, um, that can be controlling, right? Or it could be forcing the other person to have to be engaged, which that's no fun. Again, why are you in a relationship? If you're constantly fighting and making up, so um, I would see that a lot. I still see it a lot, especially with people changing their social media statuses, right? In a relationship, not complicated, all that stuff. Um, if you're constantly fighting and making up, it's exhausting. And exhausting is the opposite of energized. So, it may, you may like that adrenaline rush that you get from the making up, but um, eventually you're gonna burn out and it's not a healthy relationship. So just know that you don't need to be in a relationship. Um, so if you're in one just because you don't wanna be alone, like that isn't a healthy relationship, perfectly fine to not be in a relationship. That is a perfectly acceptable thing. Um, Non-stop texting, okay, that is controlling. Like you can put, again, you need your you time. You don't need to constantly be responding to someone or texting them. Um, you should be able to put your devices down and disconnect for a little bit. If, so the last two seem no big deal, right? If your partner posts pictures of you on social media without telling you or uses your things without asking, so they may seem like that's not really a big deal, um, but the thing is it is because so if you didn't tell them that you don't want your picture posted on social media, how are they gonna know? Okay, so that's the first problem. You need to communicate that boundary. But if you do tell them, you're like, hey, I don't want you to post my picture on Snapchat, or um, I don't want you to use my laptop, okay? Those are things that you've told them. If they go and do it anyway, they're crossing a boundary. And yeah, it may seem like it's not a big deal, but they're not respecting your boundaries, and that is a big deal. And we're gonna talk a little bit more about social media. So um, this can be a lot bigger issue than just thinking like, all right, they posted a picture, what's the big deal? Or they used my laptop. But that means that they're not respecting your stuff um, and they're not respecting your boundary that you set. All right, learn to do some communication. All right, so um, we're gonna do a little activity and I need three volunteers. Yay, and if you don't volunteer, I'll pick you. <laughs> there is candy involved. Yes, that too. It's super simple. You're just going to read like two lines off the card. See the difference in high school? Because they're actually like, what are we volunteering for? Yeah. <laughs> All right, since you asked, you're a volunteer. Uh, yeah, get Beast, to it. Hoodie, and Cameron, I think. She's yep. with me? Yeah. Okay. So, yeah, you guys can line up.
myself as to like body language and stuff. And then the black parts, what you're trying to say out loud. I know yours is kind of difficult because you're like talking to yourself, but just say it out loud and I'll explain your question or explain your thought to the class. So, say it. Yeah, just say it out loud. Okay, so they're going to be um, asking for candy, and you guys are going to decide which one should get the candy by the way they are speaking. Okay? I look smart at you. Maybe if I stand here and smile, she'll give me candy for being a nice person. All right, so maybe. So yeah, he's basically talking to himself. Um, so that's what that one was. Why did you do that? Okay. It's obvious I should get the candy, so stop playing and just give it to me. <laughs> okay. Excuse me, may I please have the candy? I'd like it and would appreciate it. All right, so which one do you think communicated the best? Him in the middle? No. Over there? Okay. Why? Because he asked politely. He asked politely, okay. Well, so did he, didn't he? Right? No? He didn't ask. Exactly. Yeah. Great. All right, you guys did a great job. You will all get candy. You can grab stickers. Um, you like? Yeah, you have stickers. I'll get a sticker. So, what about the person in the middle? How did they communicate? Person. Yeah, aggressive, right? You guys, um, after you get candy, you can get that. Okay, thank you. All right, so yeah. So, he was passive in the, the first one. The middle was aggressive, and then he was assertive. Yeah, just take one. Whatever one you like. So passive means that someone is um, interested in avoiding conflict. So that's why he didn't really ask. Um, he was deflecting the question. They may have feelings or needs or desires, but they don't really express them directly. Aggressive means that someone expresses their feelings or needs, desires in a hostile manner. So they don't really care about what other people think. They just want to get what they want. And then assertive means that they express their feelings, desires, or needs in an open and direct way, um, in a respectful manner. So this is if we didn't have time for the activity, but we did. So assertiveness rights. When you're being assertive, um, you have rights um, when you're speaking to other people. So you have rights to express yourself honestly, and um, you have the right to ask for exactly what you want. And you have the right to change your mind at any time as well. Uh, you have the right to do what is best for you, and going into a sexual sense, uh, if someone's asking you to have sex, you have the right to say no, even when, if they say they love you or if they threaten to leave you. Because if you were in that healthy relationship that Nicole was talking about, and they really do truly love you, and when you when they asked to have sex and you said no, um, they would love you and respect that decision. Um, so if they really did love you, they would stay with you and everything would be fine. Um, even if you've had sex before, or if you have had sex with that person before, so going back to consent, just because you've had sex with them before doesn't automatically mean you can do it whenever you want. Um, they still have to ask and you still have a right to say no if you don't want to, and they should respect that decision. Even if they promise to marry you, be your life partner, or if it'll prove love or commitment. So love does not prove anything. It doesn't mean you're a legitimate couple. It doesn't mean you love each other. There's plenty of ways to show love without sex. Sex does not equal love. Okay, so if you do love that person, but you're not ready to have sex with them, that is completely okay. And if they use arguments or persuade you, so going back to consent, again, if they use persuasion, manipulation, or threats, um, that's not consensual sex, and they are crossing that boundary. So when you're asking assertively for what you want, um, you state a fact or feeling. So in the candy example, Cameron was like, I really like that candy, so that's a fact or a feeling. Uh, so you can say, I feel, or um, I understand, I don't like it when you do this, or I'm feeling. It's pretty simple. And then the second part is just directly ask for what you want. So in the candy example, when Cameron was like, I really like that candy, may I have some please? So he said it's a fact, and he asked directly for what he wanted. So you can do, could I, may I, um, let's do this, I really wish you would do this. There's a lot of examples there. All right, so going back to like a sexual sense, um, stating a factor feeling. So I really love you. Um, I feel like we're ready for this next moment. May we have sex? So that's directly asking for what you want. So you, when using uh, assertive communication, you can do it with anybody. It doesn't have to be just your partner. It doesn't have to be anybody. You can do your teachers, um, parents, anything like that. 
friendships. So you can use this communication when you're talking about relationships, sexuality, um, when you're talking to your partner about your needs, feelings, or wants. Um, so again, you say the fact you're feeling about what you need, and then you ask directly for what you want. Um, you can also use it, so here's an example with a teacher. You can say, instead of being like, wow, I really wish I could get my grade up, you could first say, wow, my grade's really low. I wish I could get it up. And then second, ask for what you want. So can I get an extra credit? I notice my grade's low. Back, could I have extra credit? Is the answer. All right, so saying no can be hard sometimes. Um, you might feel like you're gonna hurt someone's feelings or something like that. And no one wants to get their feelings hurt. So you may feel bad for saying no, but you shouldn't. Um, if you really don't wanna do something, you should feel comfortable saying no. So there's ways to do that. So we're gonna teach you the sandwich approach. So first, you can say something nice. So if someone's asking you to have sex and you really don't want to, yeah. You've heard of it? Yeah. It, it has uh, came up sometimes. I think I've heard of it before too. Okay. So yeah, when someone's asking you to have sex and you're not ready and you really want to say no, here's a good way to do it. So say something nice first. Be like, I really do love you or I really do care for you, um, but no. So the second part of this is to refuse. Um, make sure you say the word no, so there's no miscommunication, because uh, no is universal. Everyone knows what no means. So I really do love you, but no, I do not want to have sex with you. And then the second part, or the, sorry, the third part is you can suggest an alternative. So you can be like, I really do love you, but no, I'm not gonna have sex with you. However, we could cuddle. That's an alternative, and if they say, if you say, um, if they say yes to that, then that's cool. You guys can cuddle. Um, but this is a way to kind of avoid any hurt feelings or anything like that and make them feel more comfortable without just saying, oh no. Um, you don't have to use this approach, but you could if you needed to. So just like saying no is hard, taking no for an answer is hard too. If you do feel like you have gotten to that point in your relationship where you can um, have sex or have that physical intimacy um, and the other person's not ready, hearing no can be really hard and it could hurt your feelings. So to avoid that, you can, so you get a no, say you ask for sex and someone says no, you can ask for a second choice. So like in that cuddle situation, you're like, well, if they're not gonna have sex, can they, can they cuddle at least? Or would you consider, well, could we do this? There's lots of different examples. But if they still say no, Accept it, okay? Because then if you keep pressing for more physical intimacy or anything, not just sex related, if you keep asking, that's bordering the line of consent and you're getting kind of aggressive. Um, so the ways to accept it gracefully, just straight up say, okay, all right, um, I understand, I hear you, okay. Um, so yeah, remember if a person has to say no to not only your first question of having sex, but your second question of cuddling, then you're being aggressive, uh, even if they're not saying no. So like, I don't know, I don't feel like it, stuff like that, that's still not really good. Um, so yeah, make sure you're asking for a second choice and just accepting it if they keep saying no. So I statements are really important when you're trying to be assertive and communicating your needs, wants, or desires with your partner or anybody, um, like your teacher, stuff like that. So. Here's a regular example. You never respond to my text. You don't even care about me. So when you're hearing that from like, in, from when someone's telling you that, you kind of get on a defense mode and you're like, well, I do love you or I do respond or whatever. You try to hop on the fence train, right? So instead of saying you, 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 you can say I. So I feel hurt when you don't respond to me because I feel like I'm not important to you. That's more calm, right? and you're expressing yourself in a way that doesn't feel accusatory. So, yeah, and I know it feels kind of formulaic and like a math situation because there's a whole bunch of blanks and stuff, but the more you practice, it'll come naturally. Uh, it's really not that hard. So like, I feel hurt when you don't hold my hand in public because I feel like you're embarrassed of me. That could be, a very valid reason to be upset. Instead of saying, well, you never hold my hand in public, you don't even love me. See, that's kind of, 
you can see the difference there. So this is the best way to communicate your sexual boundaries, desires, or anything like that with your partner. Alright. Alright, yeah. So all that communication stuff, um, the assertive communication, it's really important to know. That's for like a relationship. Okay. Um, if you are unsafe at any point or you feel unsafe, um, just say, you don't have to say no assertively. You do whatever you need to do to get out of that situation, okay? So like the saying no assertively, that's for, um, you know, if you just don't, to a friend or a partner, not if you're in an unsafe situation. So just clearing that up. Um, yeah, all those techniques, it may seem, like Lauren said, kind of just like we're giving you formulas, but really, honestly, they will help you be better at so many things in your life. Like communication is one of the hardest things to do. Um, I personally, um, oh, I um, I always try to take a step back before communicating with someone, especially um, since we're going to talk about digitally, because um, you know sometimes communication can be spawned by our emotions. So it's really important to have some tools in your in the back of your mind. Um, those I statements, right? I had a chart um, with like all different emotions and everything that can help you communicate that better. Um, yeah, I use it like I use it with my kids, right? Like, so they'll always be fighting and they'll be like, "Hey, you know, he did this, or you know, he he shut me out of my, out of my room, or whatever." And I'm like, "Okay, but how did you feel with that?" Because otherwise, you're gonna put up walls. Like Lauren said, with the communication, if you're using aggressive communication, that's going to cause you to put up a wall and the person you're talking to is gonna become defensive. And honestly, defensiveness breaks down communication. All right, it's just gonna stop. You're not even gonna talk about your stuff. And like I said, the difference between a healthy and unhealthy relationship is um, how you communicate about issues. So in the couple minutes we have left, we're gonna start this section. Um, what time is it? 45. Okay. okay. So, we'll, yeah, we'll talk a little bit. Um, I'll give you some things to think about. So this section is new, something new that we added that we feel is really important. Um, I want to know what you guys need to know here. So, first of all, tell me, are you using social media? I am. Yeah. Like, what social media do you use? Snapchat. Okay. Um, <laughs> we're gonna we're gonna do an activity that's just Facebook, and I know nobody uses that anymore. But I only I use Twitter, but I only really use it for like art. For what? Art. Art. Okay. You use all of them? Yeah. Yeah. Like it's there's nothing wrong with that. It's an awesome like way to communicate with each other. It's an awesome way to like get art out there, right? Especially things like that. Um, so there are some really positive things that can come up with um, how we use like technology and social media. I, like I've told you guys, like I don't live here, like I live here, but my family is all around the country. So social media is the best way for me to like have a relationship still with people. Um, but we're just gonna talk about how to do it safely and some of the things that like we should be doing um, and some of the things that maybe we're not thinking about and I'm also gonna give you some statistics and things like that. Um, yeah. Gaming. Yes, gaming is another one, right? So does anyone in here play games, like video games? Yeah, right? Um, <laughs> it was really funny in one of the middle school, remember when we were at the middle school and we talked about GTA and the mm -hmm. one kid was like, no, there's nothing sexual in GTA at all. Everyone knows. <laughs> right? I know. I was like, are you yeah. serious? I was like, are you playing the same game? Because I'm not sure. Um, but yeah, so you get messages of sexuality and sex in video games too, right? Like, so I play a lot of um, RPGs and stuff like that, like role playing games. Um, and my thing is like, the female characters, right? Like, if I'm going to go into battle, like, my midriff is not going to be exposed because that's where all my vital organs are. All right, so like, I'm gonna cover that up. But in games, all the female characters are always dressed a certain way. So just noticing things like that too as you're, um, as you're like 
playing this stuff. And then when it comes to like Call of Duty, things like that, that you're playing online with people, um, you may not even think of that as being like a type of social, like social media or social um, event, but it really is. And there's a lot of things like that can happen. Um, so one of the things that comes up a lot when we talk about this is like swatting, right? Like people, you guys know what that is? Yeah, great. Okay, so like because people can find out your information. And we're going to talk about all those things. So it's going to talk a little bit about internet safety, which I'm sure you've talked about before. But just think about that and come to class Friday ready to talk about it. So question box to not be gratis. 